Welcome to another conversation in North Dakota history. My name is Larry Remily with the State Historical Society of North Dakota. Our, this conversation, as all of our others have been, is sponsored by a grant from the North Dakota Humanities Council and is part of an ongoing program series at the North Dakota Heritage Center. Our program series for this particular conversation is the fur trade in North Dakota, and our specific subject will be the early fur trade along the upper Missouri River. Our guest is Dr. W. Raymond Wood, noted anthropologist from the University of Missouri. Welcome, Dr. Wood. Thank you. To begin, to begin our conversation, uh, I think that probably it'd be interesting to know the background to the fur trade along the Missouri River. Uh, how important was this fur trade, and was it very substantial? It was substantial. The aspect of the trade I suspect we'll focus on is the trade from what was New France and which became uh, Canada uh, later on. There was trade between the early French and the early British uh, traders in Canada and on the upper Missouri River. It was not as substantial as the St. Louis-based steamboat fed uh, fur trade of later years, but there was a great deal of activity going on between the uh, late 1700s and 1818. So the fur trade along the Missouri River then had uh, a large or a small part in terms of the overall fur commerce in the, uh, in, in the great center of, the, of North America? It would be hard to say just how important it was in terms of percentage because the early fur trade is very, very poorly documented. For the St. Louis-based fur trade, there are documents or diaries of all sorts. For the early period, there, the story really has to be pieced together from individual little documents in many archives, and the evidence is really very slim. So it's sometimes very difficult to talk about some aspects of it. Now, the fur trade, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, was based from the French and the, the French colonies along the St. The Saint Lawrence in uh, Quebec, what, is, what at that time was called New Canada, I assume. Uh, how did it get to the Northern Plains? What is the method of transfer? Um, All right, there are two means. Well, one means, but two routes. The uh, traders operating out of New France started in Montreal and by a long series of canoe voyages and portages uh, brought their, in, their goods to the forks of the Red River, uh, modern, modern Winnipeg, and then up the Assiniboine River. These are the French traders operating out of Montreal for the Northwest Company. The competing opposing company, Hudson's Bay Company, operated from posts along the Hudson Bay itself. Uh, Albany Factory, for example, goods would come by ship into Hudson Bay to Albany Factory, then they would be taken by a separate and more northern uh, route up the English River and eventually end up at uh, near the modern site of Winnipeg and then up the Assiniboine River again. So there are two routes. They were both being supplied from overseas that, was, that were feeding uh, trade goods from eastern New France to the northern plains. What kind of a chronology are we talking about with regard to this phase of the, this, this preliminary phase to the Missouri River fur trade? Well, the fur trade began in a sense with the explorations of the Le Barandres in the northern plains. Le Barandre entered North Dakota in 1738 but unfortunately, his, for the, unfortunately for the French, uh, his early explorations were met with indifference and eventually he was recalled to uh, eastern uh, New France and the, the trade that he might otherwise have initiated in the 1730s simply lapsed. Uh, trade did continue kind of sporadically as far as the documents can tell us until about 1784. 1785, when the British Northwest Company founded a fort on the Assiniboine River for trade with the Missouri River Indians, specifically the Mandan and Hadatsa. And it operated for many, many years. The Hudson Bay Company, of course, came in and built a competition post uh, a few years later called Brandon House, near the, obviously, city of the same name. And the, uh, the two posts competed for the period uh, the late 1700s up until 1818. 
there was very, very little trade from Canada to the Missouri River after about 1812. A few traders continued to go back and forth, but after the American, bound, American Canadian boundary was established, the uh, Canadian traders were discouraged from <laughs> crossing the international boundary, and the, uh, the entire trade was, as far as we know, dropped from that direction by 1818. But at the same, but prior to that 1818 cutoff date, there was a substantial amount of traffic between uh, the forks of the Assiniboine and the Red and the Missouri River. Uh, you mentioned a, a phrase ex uh, called the Mandan Connection. Uh, uh, what, what does that refer to? <clears throat> well, the Assiniboine Indians had been trading with the Mandans long before the French or British appeared on the scene. And the, uh, they had what the fur traders sometimes called the Assiniboine Road. It was a trail which led from all oh, approximately the uh, mouth of the uh, Suris or Mouse River uh, to the southwest, then along the west side of Turtle Mountain, and then across the uh, lowlands of the uh, Suris River, then across that plain which separates the uh, Suris from the Missouri River, a flat feature fairly featureless plain that the traders called the Mandan Plain. It was a, that's what they called it. <laughs> now this, how much traffic was there on this? Was that a substantial amount of, 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 inter uh, of, of interchange between these, uh, these, these groups of people? Very often, well, most of the expeditions went down there obviously during the winter and very early spring to pick up the, uh, the winter uh, skins and, and furs. The uh, Hudson Bay Company and the Northwest Company uh, invariably sent down each an expedition. Now, sometimes the expeditions went together. They may have been competing, but on the Assiniboine Road, uh, there <laughs> quite a number of them were killed by the Assiniboine <laughs> and by the Sioux. So on, in some years, it was a very, a very dangerous voyage. And so they, uh, they went together, in spite of the fact they were competitors, they went together for mutual protection. How, how big a party would uh, would Traverse would make that trip from uh, down the Assembly oh, Road? Five or six to ten or twelve. That's a very small party, uh, considering the uh, the threat of attack from Plains Indians. True. Uh, a number of them didn't make it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, uh, an aspect of that, that road also was that they almost never went by horseback. The horses were available, but... Uh, for reasons that aren't explained in the documents, they rarely went by horseback. They walked from the Assiniboine River, the, well, depending on their route, but perhaps 150 miles on foot to the Mandan Hidatsa villages. Of course, this was done in the winter. Huh. And some of the uh, descriptions of their treks down there are blood curdling. <laughs> Uh, David uh, David Thompson, for example, made a trip down there in the uh, winter of 1796 and 7. He was on the road 33 days, pulling sleds on foot. <clears throat> I think on only four days did the temperature rise above freezing. My. And it was a, on four separate occasions, he recorded in his journal, this is the worst day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> You have to absolutely admire the stamina these people had to, to make that trip during the winter, particularly if you think about what the weather was like a couple of days ago. <laughs> <laughs> now, what kind of, uh, did they use sled dogs too to pull, or was it all strictly human motive power? Well, part of it was uh, carried by, on, on their backs, but they, uh, uh, the documents aren't too ex explicit, but they, they did use sleds and dogs uh, at least part of the time. And on rare occasions, they did use horses. But most of the accounts we have of horses, they were, they were runners or messengers running back and forth that had to get back and forth quickly. But most, I suppose, 90% of it was on foot. Well, what kind of goods are we talking about? You know, were these fur trade outfits, these, these fur trade packs? Well, they were carrying rather small volume but high, high value goods, such as guns, gun parts, gun flints. Um, butcher knives, uh, pointed and edged weapons and tools of all sorts, uh, trade beads, uh, vermilion, uh, 
some of the more bulky items were uh, blankets and uh, overcoats of various sorts and uh, we put together a list of some hundred items that they were carrying back and forth regularly. And when they got to the Mandan villages, they traded with the Mandans or? With the Mandans and with the Thadatses. There, there was, it did not become, uh, the villages did not become a trading center where other tribes would know that these expeditions were showing up and then would show up at the same time to trade. No, no. They basically simply traded with the residents of the villages at the, these were the villages at the mouth of Knife River most of which are now in Knife River Indian Village's National Historic Site. Okay, did the Mandan make a deliberate effort to keep these other tribes unaware of the arrival of these? No, I don't believe they did that. The, uh, but most of the tribes which came to the Mandan, like the Cheyenne and others that came in to trade with the Mandan, usually came in the fall uh, rather than the winter. I, I think they were rather smarter than the fur traders. They didn't stay. <laughs> they didn't come in when the weather was really bad. The fur traders did. Okay. So, but the Mandan and the the Mandan and the Hidatsa villages served then as as a trading center. Uh, peop, uh, the other the uh, uh, fur traders themselves would show up uh, in the uh, in the late winter, early spring, and then the following fall, uh, those goods that they had brought with them would be traded again to uh, roving tribes who would come in to trade in, at those villages. Right, the Mandan and Hidatsa villages were an important trade center, Aboriginal native trade center in North in uh, North Dakota. Every fall, Cheyenne. This is in the period of Lewis and Clark. Uh, Cheyenne, Arapaho, the Crow would come from the south and west. The uh, Sioux would come in from the east and the Cinnaboyne from the north and, and others and trade products of the hunt, essentially. These were nomadic tribes with the village peoples, uh, basically with their, for their agricultural produce. At least this, was the, this is what the women were doing. While the women were exchanging these kinds of goods, men were exchanging horses and guns and trade goods in large quantities. So every fall, the Indians had a big trade fair, if you will, at the Mandan Hidatsa villages. But the uh, fur traders never really became involved in that. That was a Native American institution that the traders did not try to usurp. Why not? Was it just bad business for them, or did they just decide? I think they were there simply at the, the uh, they were there at the wrong time of the year. Ah, uh, okay. But in all honesty, I, I think the better answer was I can't tell you, <laughs> <laughs> or we don't know. Um, so the, the, the Indian, the Aboriginal trade then had been going on uh, quite extensively prior to the uh, imposition of their, or the interpolation of the, of the white trade. Right, archeologically we can document some kind of continental trade that the man then and their ancestors were uh, involved in for nearly seven, eight hundred, almost a thousand years. Trade has always been important to the American Indian. So, there, and then there, that means that there was an established network that traded goods from one area to another. And uh, right. I'm assuming then that the fur trade just uh, piggybacked on top of that trade. In part, yes. The uh, the Mandan. Uh, even before Lewis and Clark arrived on the scene, were engaged in trade which brought to their villages goods all the way from the west coast of the United States. Uh, dentalium, which is a little tusk-shaped shell that are on, it's on many Indian costumes, and it was a very favored Indian decoration, uh, comes from mainly from Vancouver Sound, and it was traded tribe to tribe, eventually re across the Rocky Mountains, reaching the Crow, and eventually came to the Mandan villages. Uh, they were in, involved in very long-range, very long-range trade. At the time, uh, Verandre and his sons were visiting Mandan villages. The Mandan were in close contact with groups in the American Southwest. Uh, for example, some of the descriptions that uh, Verandre heard about what were supposed to be American Indians were actually descriptions of Spanish settlements in the American Southwest. <laughs> and this led to a good deal of confusion at the time. Yeah, is this trade network generally known? I mean, uh, it seems to me almost fantastic that people who were uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in an aboriginal situation could, make, uh, could travel such long distances and that their goods would move over such a complicated network. Well, trade is important to, has been important to every human group we know 
it obviously began sometime in the old Stone Age, and it's become just more and more important over time. Uh, many groups found trade important enough that they would suspend hostilities to trade. In the fall of the year, for example, when the Sioux came to the, the Mandan, Hadatsa, and further south to the Rikra villages, uh, they might have been had a pitched battle the day before, but when they came into the village, there was a kind of a trade peace. There was a truce, and they would go into the homes and trade with people. And during the day, the military societies of the two groups would keep hotheads away from each other and kind of make sure everybody got along. But the minute the Sioux would leave the village, out of sight of it, they might be at each other's throats that night. But when they were in the village, a truce was maintained. Because the, the Sioux did not grow corn. A, well, a few of them did, but they're clearly the exception. But they loved it. And they, were, they would come to the villages and get corn and agricultural produce. And they were interested enough in this produce that they were willing to suspend warfare for, for that day or two that was involved. Now, what kinds of furs are we talking about that being part of this exchange, you know, especially the aboriginal exchange? Well, furs were n not terribly important in the aboriginal exchange, although some of them, there were a few furs being exchanged. Uh, aboriginally, most of the, the uh, trade was in perishable goods that leave nothing for us archaeologists or little for us archaeologists to find. What we find for the most part are seashells and obsidian, a volcanic glass, which is, which is widely traded. A few of these very durable artifacts probably represent just a very minute proportion of what was being trade, pre, traded prehistorically. Would I be remiss if I uh, asked you to talk about Knife River Flint's role in, in all of this? There are people who know a great deal more about Knife River Flint than I do at the <laughs> university. Uh, but Knife River Flint was mined at a large number of quarries on the middle reaches of the Knife River, just west of the Knife River Indian villages. And apparently these uh, quarries have been important over a long, long period of time because in, in Colorado, uh, Knife River Flint artifacts are found dating back 8,000 or more years. So it was, it, it was traded down there. It was traded east in quantities during the uh, Hopewell or Middle Woodland period in Illinois. There is a substantial volume of Knife River Flint. Uh, so it's been widely traded for thousands of years. So I bring it up simply to mention one of the durable goods that's native to this area that became part of this of, of this Aboriginal trade. Yes. So the, the the trade, if if I'm understanding uh, uh, what you're what you're telling me, the trade was primarily in perishables when it was when it was strictly Indian to Indian. Right. Now, what was the big change when the when the Euro Americans moved in, you know, became involved in this? At network? some point, this exchange of agricultural produce for products of the hunt, uh, at, at some point grafted to that was the, uh, the trade in horses. The Mandan and Hidatsa villages were very important in the diffusion of the horse across North America and the gun because the Spanish in the Southwest refused to trade guns to the Indians. Well, in Canada, the British and French traders uh, didn't just didn't bother them. They were trading guns all the time. So the gun was being introduced into the northern plains, essentially from Canada, from the very posts I'm talking about on the Assiniboine River. Uh, they were being traded down to the Missouri River. Horses, having been introduced from the American Southwest, were being brought to the Mandan villages in exchange for guns. So the, the frontier of the of the horse from the American Southwest and the frontier of the gun kind of met at the Mandan Hidatsa villages and provided them, them with a uh, very lucrative uh, trade because some of the early accounts suggest that the Mandans were getting a 100% markup on goods passing through their hands. The Cinnaboyne would bring down <laughs> guns and the Mandans would uh, exchange horses with them that they had obtained from say the Crow Indians or the or the Cheyenne at a very good markup. The uh, Mandan villages were really a 
kind of a warehouse for trade in the Northern Plains in the, in the years before and for a time after Lewis and Clark. This is a, a very unfair question, but uh, what would, would, a, would a gun be equal in value to a horse? I mean, obviously we can't tell at this stage, but... Well, yes, it wasn't a fair <laughs> question, because the uh, value of these things did vary depending upon the, uh, on the quantity. Uh, earlier, perhaps, a, uh, you know, when guns and horses were both rare, uh, we really don't know in the early years what they were worth. But as both became more common, the, the rate of exchange would be, be quite different. It would depend upon how many uh, traders came down to the villages, how much of this stuff was available. I think in a sense you're asking me a question I can't answer, so let's go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we basically have at this point, uh, in, in the, say about the middle of the, of the 18th century, about 1750 or thereabouts, we have an established trade network leading from the Mandan villages to the Assiniboine River. Assiniboine and Red Junction, and we have this established trade network of aboriginals uh, that's, that's, that fans out throughout the West and Southwest. Uh, how do the Europeans uh, come onto the scene, and how do they get involved in this network? Well, they came onto the scene, uh, firstly, Verandre's explorations in 1738, as I say, when, when he was recalled to, to the eastern uh, Canada in 17. 44, I believe it was. The trade lapsed for a while, but we know in 1756, Fort Lorraine, which is the point of departure for Verandre to, to North Dakota, was still operating. Traders were still going back and forth, but we have, I think, two documents which describe the trade between <laughs> well, Verandre's time and about uh, 1785. It's a very, very poor, poorly known period. And then thereafter, it generates more, or is there, does it become more uh, uh, intense? Uh, are there more tra well, trains moving? Or? In 1785, of course, with the establishment of Northwest Company's posts, Pine Fort and, uh, and the competing Northwest Company Brandon post, things started picking up. And for the period 17, let's say, 1790 to just a little after Lewis and Clark was the real heyday of the, what's sometimes called the North Traders. This is what they called themselves. They were coming in from the north to the Missouri River, okay. um, for the most part illegally, of course, because um, the Mandan villages, by European concepts, were part of the uh, Spanish North America. And when the Spanish discovered that the English traders were coming to the Mandan villages, they promptly dispatched a uh, expedition to the villages to tell them, stay out of this, this area. This is our domain. <laughs> And in 1796, a Welchman arrived at the Mandan villages as a uh, employee of the, uh, the Spanish company in St. Louis to tell the North traders to stay away. <laughs> of course, the Spanish never sent their own traders up there, <laughs> so it was kind of a futile gesture. Basically one that uh, attempting to establish sovereignty where there was no way of enforcing it. Right. Mm -hmm. the way that goes. Well, what is the first fort established at the Mandan villages on the Upper Missouri or on the Upper Missouri? The first Euro-American post was a place that we simply call Jassom's Post today. It was built by René Jassom, uh, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, a uh, French uh, employee of the Northwest Company. It was built somewhere uh, between the Mandan villages and the Hadatsa villages up by the mouth of the Knife River. Uh, no one knows where it is. It simply consisted of a house and uh, a few sheds, apparently, built by this Northwest Fur Company in 1794, I believe. And as far as we know, it didn't survive 1797. When John Evans came up the river, the Welchman I just mentioned, he appropriated the fort and lived there that winter and um, do we know about Jassam's uh, business, what kind of business he had? And well, from, from time to, most of the time he was an employee of the Northwest Company, occasionally acted as an independent trader, but most of the time he was a, an employee of the Northwest Company, you know, leading expeditions for that company to the villages. He was down there many, many times over the 
of course, this period of time I was mentioning. Okay, well, and following Jassam's post, which is basically a short lived um, fur post in that area, uh, who comes next? Well, essentially, the uh, St. Louis based fur companies uh, began building posts in the Knife River area. Uh, Manuel Lisa, a Spanish uh, uh, trader from St. Louis, built Lisa's post. A few years later, Fort Vanderburg, uh, it has some other names, but Fort Vanderburg seems to be the <laughs> favorite, or is emerging the champion favorite, uh, which were occupied fairly, for fairly short periods of time. They weren't really too important. Uh, the, the posts up there really did not become substantial until the uh, construction of Fort Clark in 1830 or 1831 at Tutahunkash, the big Mandan village that is now uh, enclosed in Fort Clark State Historic Site. Okay. So these, these, these initial forts then, uh, we're talking Vanderburg and Jassam's Post and others of that, of, of that nature were basically temporary and transitory. Well, they probably were not. Jassam's Post was probably just a cabin in a small stockade. Uh, Lisa's Post and Fort Vanderburg probably were more substantial operations, but they simply did not survive. We really don't know what they look like. Uh, have no real description of them, and no one has ever located e any of these three posts. Were they year-round operations? Well, Jassam's post probably was seasonal. It's probably something they built and simply occupied when the Northwest traders came down, because when our Welchman came up from St. Louis working for the Spanish, it's, it simply says he took over this post. Well, if there had been some British traders in there, I, would have, I suspect they would have objected. And there's no uh, record of any altercation or confrontation of any sort. So I suspect it was simply there, and they used it when they were there. But uh, Lisa's post and Fort Vanderburg would have been manned more, uh, more continuously. But neither of those posts lasted more than a couple of years. Now, how were these posts supplied? I mean, how did they get there in the first place? essentially by keelboat at this time. The same means essentially by which Lewis and Clark got up there. They were either pulled, these are large boats that were either pulled up the river or pulled up the river with, with ropes. And so the amount of trade goods that could come into the villages at this time was fairly, fairly limited. But with the arrival of the first steamboat in 18, uh, in the 1830s, I should know that date. <laughs> and the, uh, the Yellowstone uh, trade goods began being transported up the Missouri River by the ton, by the steamboat load. So after 1830, uh, goods began arriving just in massive quantities. Okay. I might mention that the, although the beaver pelts were the preferred commodity, that there was very, very little in the way of beaver being traded out of the Missouri River. Uh, Verandri is quite obviously disappointed in the quantity and quality of the beaver pelts coming from the Missouri River because he and the other traders from the north were used to the rich, uh, luxurious pelts that, that came from the uh, more northern uh, and nor northeasternly uh, Canadian streams. So what kind of pelts were they primarily trading then? Uh, Beaver when they could, because it was a preferred. Uh, kit fox, wolf, and obviously coyote too. Uh, an occasional bear skin, uh, occasional otter skin. Um, but most of the trade really was in uh, what I've just mentioned. Okay. Now later on, after the arrival of the uh, steamboats, the uh, fur trade really became buffalo robe trade. Okay. So certainly these big outposts with tons of goods, <laughs> there's far more there to trade than, than for the few beaver that happened to be around. So they were really uh, interested in buffalo robes and deer and elk skins. And so the fur trade deteriorated or changed <laughs> to a uh, robe and skin trade. Okay. The 
the, the period between about 1800 then, or 1807, and 1830, or early 1830s, 1830, 1831, when Fort Clark was established, uh, was the fur trade obviously continued during that particular right. period. Uh, did it undergo any changes during that era? Did the imposition, for example, of the international boundary force redirection of the trade totally? Well, the after Lewis and Clark, St. Louis-based fur trade companies found it much easier to bring vast quantities of goods upriver. It was possible for the uh, Canadian or North traders to transport transport overland, 150 miles from the Assiniboine River to the uh, Mandan villages. So they were, they would have been outcompeted in, under any circumstances because the goods that came down from Canada, recall, had to come from Montreal by canoe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there is, anybody who's familiar with the, with this route, I'm sure, I've forgotten now the length of the uh, canoe route from Montreal to, to uh, the mouth of the Cirrus River, but it was well over a thousand miles. Yeah, everything had to be transported by canoe and dozens and dozens of portages. And so the, the quantity of goods they could get out there was finite in contrast to the tons of goods which any steamboat could bring up. And of course, their steamboats just increased uh, in quantity. This is not an era I know well, the steamboat trade, but there were many, many of them for, for many years. And Canadians couldn't have competed even if they had wanted to. Okay, uh, so the, the, the trade basically shifted from that pre-1800 period, uh, a north trade, down to a, a south trade based out of St. Louis. Louis based trade. Mm -hmm. Okay, who became the major entrepreneurs of this, uh, of, this of this trade? Well, the giant of the fur trade, of course, was the American fur company, John Jacob Astor's outfit. Uh, it was this outfit which built Fort Clark, which built Fort Union, uh, the two really probably two most, single most important fur posts in, in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. And the, the founding uh, fathers of that particular fur company were? John Jacob Astor. John Jacob Astor, and he, and he was based out of St. Louis? Well, is that not a New York name? Oh, yeah. Uh, but he, so you're moving in, into the, the St. I'm not as familiar with the St. Louis-based fur trade as I am with the uh, Canadian fur trade. The, the St. Louis-based fur trade is a, has a very long and very complex history. Uh, people were constantly uh, amalgamating and reorganizing and uh, partners were shifting and the alliances were... Uh, it's very difficult to put together, for example, a chart of the fur trade histories because it's constantly undergoing reorganization. And I frankly am not too familiar with, with that aspect of it except on a very, very general level. But the Canadian trade was basically uh, off the Missouri River by about 1818, 1820 then. By 1818, it was over. Occasionally, someone would come down from Canada to the Missouri River, but it would have been a fraction of 1% of the trade. Well, what happened to all the people who were involved in that trade based in Canada then? Did they continue to... All they con uh, in part, they... Uh, they continued trading with the Assiniboine and other local groups, but the fur trade continued to expand west into western Canada, and a lot of their energies were absorbed there. And shifted the focus basically away from American territory. Right. There was only a period from, the only important period really was between about 1785 and about 1812. That's when probably 95% of the trade between Canadian posts in the Missouri River took place. It kind of just trickled out after uh, after 1812. Well, let me and after 1818, it was dead, as far as we know. Let me go back again then and, and ask a little bit about the major corporate players in this in that particular trade. Uh, obviously, you mentioned Northwest Company and the Hudson's Bay Company. Uh, were there any other corporate players, and how did they fit together into this overall scheme? Well, be t there were competition posts in opposition to Hudson's Bay Company and Northwest Company. But between them, uh, the Northwest Company and the Hudson's Bay Company control about 93% of the trade in Western Canada. At least these are the figures that professional fur trade, uh, Canadian fur trade historians mention. So the 
the non Hudson Bay Northwest Company trade was pretty uh, pretty finite. But there were a lot of independent traders. They would get their goods from the Northwest Company or the um, Hudson Bay Company and go off and trade on their own at the villages. And there's some very prominent names uh, in the early fur trade in this area. Toussaint Charbonneau, for example, was uh, just such an independent trader, although from time to time he also worked for the Northwest Company. In the 1790s, he was, was working for the Northwest Company on the Assiniboine River in Canada. Um, there was a very interesting but enigmatic man named, was simply called Old Menard. No one knows what his first name is, although there have been people have guessed. Uh, he had been in the Mandan villages for, I'm sorry, the Hadatsa villages for years. Uh, long before Lewis and Clark came up. Uh, he, he was, he lived in the villages, had an Indian wife, Indian children, and he was simply a resident of that village. And uh, he was a free or independent trader that simply got his goods from the Northwest Company and lived there and made his living. Basically then the, these independent traders would tend then to become part of the Indian community right. that they were serving. For the most part. And for the most part, we also don't know very much about them. I've compiled a list of some 10 or 12 of them that were residents for greater or lesser periods of time there, but uh, not one of them left a document uh, that explains in any detail their life there. There are no diaries, no journals. They're just references to these people. Some of them were uh, deserters from the Northwest Company, and they were regarded by the Northwest Company and the Hudson Bay Company as renegades. Uh, they had just deserted. I guess they got tired of their, their pay or, or uh, their ritual life on the post and simply moved to the Indian villages and lived there. Well, from the writings about these people, the scattered bits and pieces that you've mentioned here a minute ago, uh, what kind of a composite can we draw of them? I mean, were they uh, educated people? Were they uh, cultured? Uh, uh, do they fit at all our romantic image of the, of the free and independent trader? So little is known of them, I really would hesitate to answer that, but uh, they certainly were not educated and cultured in the sense you would expect someone with, quote, those qualities to, mm -hmm. to leave writings or, or some kind of documents or letters, and, and none of them did. Uh, but the, really the point is we know so little about them, it's very difficult to, to talk about them, except that they would obviously have been very very important media for the introduction of new alien outside ideas into the Indian communities because living there, being married to members of the community, uh, they'd be a much more likely funnel for new ideas and, and things than the traders from Canada who came down just seasonally, traded for a few days and uh, hooked their way home. But the, the, the free traders who were living in the villages then also served a function of translating one culture to another. Right. in both directions then. I'm wondering exactly, you know, if, if this is a common trait of the fur trade as it crossed North America. Most of these uh, people were French. The French tended to move into the Indian communities and intermarry uh, much more readily than did the British. I, just offhand, I can't recall a British name in that list of free traders, but there surely must have been one. <laughs> I simply can't recall offhand. Is there a reason why the French were more adept at uh, becoming part of native uh, civilizations? This is obviously a purely speculative question. Yeah, I think that's a, be a question of national character that I don't <laughs> think I could really answer. Might be uh, an awful lot like asking in, in North Dakota whether a German or a Norwegian adapts better to state politics. <laughs> I mean, best not to get involved in it, perhaps. Well, I just can't answer the question. <laughs> Curious. So basically, these, these French free traders had been there since, what, eight, 1780s, 1770s? In the, Probably since the 1770s. That long period. So in other, we really don't know when the first one showed up. Okay. Uh -huh. But did they make regular trips back? I guess my question here is, is, is what kind of, uh, of, of, of involvement did they have with the established fur posts in Canada along that uh, Cinnamon well, Road? from time to time, they went up there to become employees. And as I say, some of them were deserters from those posts. Um, 
and as I say, the people that portrayed Post regarded them as riffraff. And I think largely because they, very often, they simply took a load of <laughs> trade goods, stole it, and left, and went down to live at <laughs> the villages. So they were, in a sense, some of them at least, were thieves by the uh, accounts of the uh, traders at the posts. But the Indians accepted them. They moved into the villages and simply became community members. Oh, that's uh, Toussaint Charbonneau, of course, was living at the Sakakawea site and became the husband of guess who. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> but old Menard was a uh, also a resident of, of the Sakakawea village. He had a he lived there for something on the order of forty years. He was a very very important uh, source of information for every European explorer that came up the river, at least 11 different explorers' accounts, early important accounts of the uh, Mandans, refer to him and the information he provided them. Well, I'm just, you know, this, this whole business very much interests me because we have this romantic image of the free trader moving, uh, leaving white, quote, civilization, close quote, and then uh, disappearing uh, into the wilds. All right, you're, you're thinking of the mountain man. And the mountain man was a, a quite different kind of thing because they, the mountain men didn't really develop until after Lewis and Clark. So they the, went out into the Rocky Mountains, you know, the Jeremiah Johnson image we have of the uh, mountain man developed after Lewis and Clark and is really unrelated to the kind of thing we're talking about at the Mandan villages where we're really talking about simply people who moved in and made their home there and made their living uh, essentially as a native as an Indian there, and uh, probably made just a little extra money on the side by uh, free trading. Okay. Well, I, I've raised the issue because, uh, you know, this, this popular image, I think, is probably not directly germane to the Missouri River. Uh, not at all. at all. Not at all. And I know that uh, in my own education, for example, I was, you know, bred and I bred on this, on this romantic image of the guy with the coonskin hat, and, and, you know, uh, and his, and his Hawkins rifle or whatever it is, you know, you know proceeding, you know, forward looking into the mountains, this kind of business. Well, I'm curious about the, about the, uh, the establishment of Fort Clark in the latter period of this Missouri River fur trade. Uh, why were, why was such a large establishment built at the Mandan Hidatsa villages in the 1830s? Had the trade become such an important part of, uh, important revenue source by that time, or was it just simply the, another example of the Western well, expansionism of American business? Well, in part, it, it was both, but the uh, buffalo robes were very important in the East for all kinds of reasons. Uh, they were used as blankets, as, as uh, throw, uh, not throw rugs, but, uh, they were thrown over couches, but people wore them when they went sleigh riding. Uh, but they were—they just had many, many, many uses, and they exported as many of them as they could. And, and most of the trade out of Fort Clark was in buffalo robes. Furs were almost incidental; a small, very, very small percentage of their export. Did this change the lifeways of the of the tribes that were supplying the robes? Well, yes. Uh, in the sense that uh, to get more robes for trade, they had obviously to do more buffalo hunting. And this certainly changed the uh, family life in the sense that uh, preparing the robes was women's work. And among, I really don't have any statements from the historical literature that I can talk about the Mandan Hadatsa, but among the Crow Indians, for example, and some of the uh, nomadic groups, uh, many men begin to take more wives to prepare more skins for the trade. Buffalo, uh, preparing a buffalo hide for export, as you might suspect, was a very substantial job. And it was, uh, I really don't know how long it took, but you know, it had to be defleshed and cured. And it uh, took a lot of time. If you're going to trade a lot of these hides, really you took on more wives among the Crow and, and some of the uh, nomadic tribes. I really don't know how this affected the uh, Mandan and Hidatsa. So the fur trade then had us, had a, had, uh, uh, the word I'm looking for here and, and not finding is uh, they had a, uh, the fur trade had a substantial social effect in that it changed the composition of these societies that became involved with it. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, what kind of long-term effects did that have? I mean, is it possible to speculate about such things? I think the question has to be a little more explicit. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. Did the, uh, as the tribes became more involved in this direct commercial exchange, uh, did it change the, the structure of the tribal organization, or did the tribal well, organization adapt to that? Okay, one thing we could speculate on is the fact that the women's work used to be primarily in the gardens, raising corn, beans, and squash, and so forth, and with increased emphasis on buffalo robe trading, uh, a substantial amount of their energies would have been diverted to that. Uh, so it would affect the day-to-day you know, -day activities in any household. It may also, although I can't you know, really be specific about this, it may well have uh, encouraged men to take more wives and you know, further changing things. All of this was a way of life anyway. Uh, Thus, more people in every household. And uh, did that create a greater burden in terms of the support system to support that many, that many more mouths to feed? Well, you would obviously have to hunt more <laughs> to feed more mouths. So there are ramifications just throughout the entire social, social structure from the family level right up to the, to the village level. Interesting. As you would begin to, uh, you would have to simply be a more efficient hunter, bring in more hides. And as the buffalo began declining, of course, as the increased emphasis in the uh, hunting would have depleted the herds even further. So this was one of the uh, reasons why the herds diminished as fast as they did, because they were being hunted for hides, not for food. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking also, it, it, what you're saying sounds to me like it had a, a snowball effect, too. Uh, you, uh, you get involved in the trade, therefore you want to produce more hides, therefore you need more wives and more workers, in other words, to flesh mm -hmm. out the hides. You know, that's more mouths to feed, which means that you would have to get more efficient as a hunter, which would mean you'd have to become mechanized, which means you'd want more guns and you'd want better, efficient, more efficient systems for processing and, and getting Butcher involved. knives for butchering, and, uh, skinning and so forth, yeah. So it, would, it, would I be way out of line to say that the fur trade was, was in essence the death of uh, native aboriginal culture on the upper Missouri? Oh, I really wouldn't say it was the death of the culture uh, so much. It, may, it certainly was introduced simply major changes into everyday life, into their social life, political life, and so forth. It, it just ramified through all areas. The real death of Indian culture in the Upper Missouri River came about because of the smallpox epidemic. The epidemics, there were many of them. We tend to think of the one in Fort Clark in 1837 as being the, the epidemic, but in point of fact, Archaeologists uh, believe there probably was one as early as 1750. It's kind of more inferred than anything else, although documents refer to an early one. And there was one in 1780, which was devastating. One in 1837, which is well recorded at Fort Clark. Uh, in 1856, there was another uh, epidemic when the, when the uh, Mandans and the Datsas were living at uh, Fishhook Village. I think after, by after 1856, I think enough people had had smallpox that they began building up a natural immunity. Uh, American Indians had no natural immunity to many, many European, well, to European diseases. So 95% uh, mortality rate in a village uh, was not unusual. Can we track that mortality and the incidence of other uh, European diseases to the fur trade. Is that, a, is that one of the negative effects of the fur trade? Very definitely, yes. It, I mean, it was probably the single most important reason for the destruction of native culture. Because if you walk into any community and remove 95% of the population, chances are you're going to remove the religious specialists, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> special practitioners of all sorts, uh, people who are you know, the pottery makers, the technical, technical personnel of that society. So it, it had, the epidemics had a devastating effect on the, on the technology and general knowledge of the tribe. Well, so far we've managed to come up with two very deleterious effects of the fur trade. Were there any, on the, uh, were there any benefits of the fur trade for the native tribes? 
It, I'm speaking in the long run and culturally and that's. So in the long run, it wasn't worth it. <laughs> <laughs> not, not from the Indian point of view. No, it did introduce two uh, Indian populations, uh, a large number of labor-saving devices. There's utterly no question that butcher knives and other iron or steel weapons were much more efficient. You could skin things faster, cut up things more easily, but uh, you know, needles and all kinds of metal goods made life somewhat easier for for a ho household, but on the other hand, all of these labor-saving devices were funneled into uh, spending more time uh, preparing buffalo robes, which I'm not sure that's a fair trade. <laughs> well, I'm I'm very interested in the uh, in the the long-term effects of the fur trade, and uh, it seems to me that basically uh, that based on what you're saying, that the fur trade was uh, amounted to an entering wedge in the westernization of these of these northern plains tribes. Well, the fur trade firstly in began the introduction of European tools and weapons and ideas among the western tribes, and as the fur trade itself declined, of course, the members of the fur trade remained as residents, as early settlers, and uh, and so forth. So it, if you want to think of the fur trade as a wedge of an arrow moving west, the the uh, participants in that trade kind of di dispersed into the local area and acted really as a uh, as a fur settlers in in most areas or in many areas. Let me, let me, we have just a few minutes left, and I'd like to switch focus just, just quickly here and ask you a little bit about the methods of research into the fur trade uh, on the Upper Missouri. Uh, what are the basic techniques for learning about this very early period in our, in our uh, national history? Well, a very a substantial amount of the documents which uh, have to be used in the study of the early fur trade, a Canadian connection or the, the North Traders are in archives in Canada. There are the archives of the Hudson Bay Company, which are housed in Winnipeg. Um, the accounts by Francis Antoine Le Rock and, and others are in McGill University and the University of uh, and uh, the Toronto National Archives. Ninety percent of the information on that trade is uh, are in Canadian sources and archives, so you must become familiar with <laughs> another set of documents. Um, most of the studies of the fur trade are of the St. Louis-based fur trade. It's not unusual. This was, you know, it was an American institution. Uh, the image of the fur trade is a very romantic one. The mountain men and all of this has captured the imagination of fur trade historians. And the trade from Canada has really been neglected because it was only a small part of the overall trade. It was important, very important for a time, but uh, its overall importance is just a small fraction of the, what the St. Louis based fur traders did. Uh, so the, but there are not very many documents left, uh, except in the Hudson Bay Company. Brandon House records cover the entire period. I suspect we know most of the trips that the Hudson's Bay Company made to the uh, villages, but the Northwest Company uh, records are much more scattered. And of course, we have no records for the independent traders. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of research remains to be done up there. For example, there's, uh, I know there are many, many documents relating to the original Vrondre expedition that are still remain in Spanish archives unstudied for uh, his initial exploration in the state. Uh, what does archaeology and archaeology contribute to our knowledge of the early fur trade? Well, we can recover in the actual village sites themselves the um, gun parts and durable artifacts that were being traded down. Mm -hmm. um, and in some archaeological settings you can find even some of the uh, perishable materials. Uh, you know, parts of clothing and leather goods and so forth, and when they're embedded in ash or the proper soil, will preserve for a long time. So we've built up a very complete picture of what was being traded down to the villages 
archaeologically, which we can very easily compare with the inventories that the traders were providing us themselves. We have a, uh, an inventory made at Port Esperance, which was another uh, Northwest Port tra Trading Company, a little further west, which gave a year and inventory for the year, I think, 1795. There were several hundred items that were being traded to the local Assiniboine Indians. And of course, mm -hmm. uh, if they were being brought out from Canada for the Assiniboine trade, they would have been siphoned off with them in and that's a trade as well. So archaeology provides us with kind of a cross check against what the documents are telling us. Are there any Native American sources that contribute to this particular field of study? Unfortunately, not that I can think of because there are no written written accounts. And for the, when you're talking about the late 1700s, early 1800s, without written records, the uh, the accounts are pretty pretty become pretty nebulous. Yeah, I rather imagine that such would be the case. But I'm just kind of yeah. curious if there were winter counts or other significant things that might have been recorded in some of those Native American uh, uh, chronologies. There are occasional elements in the winter counts which you can relate to to fur trade history. For example, in some of the winter counts, you can see uh, there will be an individual representing a particular year covered with red spots. And it doesn't <laughs> take much imagination to figure out what that is. But the actual fur trade itself uh, is very elusive in those in those winter counts, mm -hmm. which were the Indian calendars, of course. Well, we're running very very close to the end of our hour here, Ray, and I I wonder if I might give you a couple of minutes just to expound a little bit on the uh, significance of this early fur trade period to the history of North Dakota and the Northern Great Plains. Well, the fur trade essentially led to the discovery of this area by Europeans. North Dakota, of course, was solidly blanketed by many, many uh, Native American groups. But the, the first entrance of Europeans into this area uh, was directly due to interest in furs. Now, Vrondry, of course, didn't find enough in the way of furs to really justify his uh, continued trading to his superiors. Um, But it acted as a drawing card for, for not only Canadian traders, uh, but traders from the Mississippi Valley. I haven't mentioned them at all, but there were traders coming to the uh, Mandan villages from uh, Prairie du Chien and other points on the Mississippi River. Hmm. So there was, it was a real magnet for people from a wide range of areas. The Illinois country, which is basically, say, the uh, St. Louis area. Uh, but the, the fur trade brought to the Indians certain technical advantages, which made life a little easier. But uh, the debit side of the trade was depopulation and basically destruction of the native fabric of, of life. So it, it was not an even trade in any sense. And the fur trade represented then the first incursion of uh, of Euro of Euro American culture into the Northern Great Plains. Into the Northern Plains, essentially. Mm -hmm. Curious. I have just a, 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 a totally off the wall question. I guess is it maybe you can explain to me. I've been asking this of everybody who's been interested in frontier history for quite some time. What is the romance with the fur trade? Or is there? Romance? I'm not really sure. Uh, it there's a tremendous popular interest in it. If you write if you write a book on a fur trade, uh, you know. There's a, there are thousands of fur trade buffs who will read, devour, and critique it. Uh, my own personal interest is, is not in that, but in just what happened when the European and Indian cultures met. We really have just barely touched on that, but that's my, my personal interest. And why I've been, why as an archaeologist I have been working with historic records. Uh, the historians have been focusing on the Missouri River fur trade from St. Louis. And the Canadian connection, as we've been calling it here, uh, really isn't known very well at all. And there's good reason for that, because the documents are so thin and sparse. In St. Louis, there are tons of documents from the American Fur Company, thousands of them, uh, from the Choteau and, and so forth. But for the northern 
connection, the Canadian connection, there's just a handful of documents, and you really have to dig deep to find anything at all. Thank, so it's, thank you for talking with us this morning, uh, Dr. Raymond Wood. Our guest has been Dr. W. Raymond Wood from the University of Missouri. This has been another conversation in North Dakota history. My name is Larry Remily. <laughs>